just some of my favorite people to talk to, and we're going to share some of the stories of the creation of the soca with you, beginning with the composer for the series, mm. Kevin Kind. <laughs> into the Star Wars universe. You were working on Avatar, The Last Airbender, the animated version of that back in 2004, I believe. Yeah, when you say it like that. And you got it a long time ago. It was 20 years ago. Yeah, this guy. <laughs> you got a call from somebody, a producer in Lucasfilm Animation, who said George recommended you. Yeah. But it was, it was not the George. Yeah, thing. not the, not George Lucas. And I had to tell that producer later, when you say you're from Lucasfilm, and George recommended you. There's only one George that could possibly mean. And it wasn't the one she met. So that was a strange. Yeah, I was working at Nickelodeon on the Airbender. Uh, my friends Mike and Brian created that show. It's a great show. Loved it. I uh, loved working on it. Thought, okay, this is, I'm set. I love doing this. And so, you know, life has a way when you're comfortable, likes to make you uncomfortable. And so I got this call out of the blue. I thought it was the SpongeBob guys making fun of me because they're next door and I know them and they're weird. <laughs> and so I was so amped about Revenge of the Sith coming out. I was talking about Star Wars nonstop as I tend to do. And Giancarlo Volpe, one of the other directors, we were having lightsaber fights and just having a great time. And so, of course, you know, people like to ruin that and say they're from Lucasfilm and they want to hire you for this job. I'm like, it doesn't exist. There is no Lucasfilm animation, none of that exists. Um, and I thought it was, you know, but I went along with it, because I thought, what's, what's the harm? And then I was kind of like feeling like maybe it's real, and I thought, oh, they're suckering me in. And so before I, I had agreed to meet them, I said, but who is this really? And the person on the phone, Catherine Winter, the producer, was like, what do you mean? I'm like, well, this is just, this isn't real. You're just, you're just being mean, and you're, I know you're from next door. And, there is no Lucasfilm animation. And she said, are you Dave Filoni? I said, yeah. She said, you work on The Last Airbender? I said, yeah. She said, so, well, you're the guy. And I said, oh. <laughs> I have no idea how the guy I am. I'm so the guy. I'm making a, a Plo Koon costume in my garage. It was not the right thing to say. But she committed to the interview. So I got to go do the interview. And my whole goal was that I was told I'd have to interview with George to get the job. The George. The actual George <laughs> Lucas, yeah. And uh, I got that interview and I thought, well, they'll realize I'm really unqualified for this job because I've never done computer animation. Everything I've done was hand-drawn. Uh, but when I met George, you know, I guess we hit it off all right. He was obviously the wise, uh, you know, wizard you want him to be and was super nice. And uh, I thought that was great. I met him off a great story in line at the movie theater when I see Revenge of the Sith, that I got to meet George Lucas, and good luck to whoever's gonna do this show. <laughs> and now it's been almost 20 years next year that I've worked at Lucasfilm. So there you go. You know, uh, I remember you telling me, again, you, you didn't think you were gonna get it, which I think is something that you shared too, Hayden, right? You thought you know, this was not gonna happen for you. Uh, yeah, absolutely, yeah, no, I, I, I uh, I didn't think it was a hoax, but I, I, I didn't think that there was any chance I was, I was going to get this role. Um, and, uh, you know, I went, I, I met with the casting director, Robin Gerland, uh, um, 
amazing woman. And then I got to go in and, and meet George Lucas at the Skywalker Ranch. And, um, and again, I sort of went in with, with no concept that this would actually go my way. I was just really excited to go and meet George Lucas. And, and I was hoping to just get like a, a souvenir from the ranch or something. <laughs> <laughs> And, and the meeting went well enough, he was really nice, and, uh, and then I got to go back and audition with Natalie, and then a few days later I got one of the best phone calls of my life. Those early experiences you two had is the, um, the show Ahsoka is so much about mentors and passing on what you've learned, and, and Star Wars itself is so much about generations, fathers and sons, Fathers and daughters in the new Acolyte series, and um, and, and uh, the mothers often die. <laughs> but I'm sure it's fitting with Disney. But the um, this show is about mentors and and and, 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 and what you take, what you pass on. Yes. Yep. You see what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> with the <wives> there. Um, <laughs> You said something to me in an interview, Dave, that I wanted to start out with. At, at a certain point after George had sold the company and uh, you were talking to him, and you, had, you, know, you brought up some question about the force and he was giving you his answer on it and then he said, but you, all, you know this, you know this, and that that was a meaningful thing to hear. Can you tell that in a better way? Yeah, I, I don't know if I believe him. He said that. <laughs> I just don't think that way. Like, I, because I worked with them, I saw firsthand what it was like, the mind that made all this. You know, when you're sitting there and, you know, he creates dialogue for Anakin and Clone Wars, you're like, oh yeah, I, yeah, I see it all. And you see the DNA of the fun and the adventure and the, the type of character voice he gives all the way through American Graffiti, you know, like, it's all there. And so, that's very, it was very nice of him, and I appreciate the nod of confidence, but, you know, I think you're also always learning, and I'm definitely always learning. I think one of the things that worked for he and I was, I wanted to listen, and I wanted to learn how to attempt to get this right, and it's a challenge. Star Wars is a particular mix of fun and adventure and tension and drama, you know, and it's not an easy balance to get, uh, and it's so George. If you know him, I mean, Hayden knows. It's it's so specific to him, and so we endeavor to try. But every now and then, I go and I, I try to get back to the source and glean a little bit uh, of what's important. That's why I like working out at the ranch still when I can. We did post for Ahsoka out at the Skywalker Ranch, and I was in the same office that I was in when I first started Lucasfilm, where we created Ahsoka. And so to have that moment where I was there. Uh, in that building with this character mm -hmm. now in live action with a lot of the same people that work on the ranch that had seen that evolution uh, of myself and the character and the team I think was meaningful that uh, this is ongoing so you try to imbue these things with a special nature like that. There does come a point where it's important it's important for the teacher as well that the student says I do have this I do understand and I feel that Ahsoka is at that point, maybe even a little past that point, where she should be in her life, where she's questioning what she's learned, whether it's right to pass on. She has doubts about Anakin because she's confronted Vader and seeing what he's become. But then Hayden, you, you have a, a, a scene, not in the world between worlds, but as a hologram of, of young Anakin, pre-Revenge of the Sith, who tells her, I'm teaching you this so you'll know what to do when I'm not there. And can, Rosario, can you talk to us about that stage in Ahsoka's life and, and the questions she has and the confidence that she gets from this episode where she meets the specter of her friend and her teacher? Oh, um, you know, I was really looking forward to this episode to work with Hayden. Um, and to, to see this moment between Ahsoka and Anakin and this um, challenge. You know, I think that she has been in a really um, stoic place for a very long time and has cut off a lot of um, herself um, for fear, you know, I think, of the possibilities 
um, the things that she can't necessarily control and she's tried to control as much as she can. And I think that's one of the things that I love so much about Star Wars is that there is no defining moment that just says, okay, you're good and you're bad and then that's it. You know, like it's, it's a choice every single day and you're challenged every single day. And what I, I love so much about, you know, this episode and, and this moment between the two of them, you know, not just in that first moment of sniffs where you get to kind of connect to the animation now becoming live action so deeply, um, but also this lightness that I think that she hasn't allowed herself to experience for a really long time. And this opportunity for her to be a little bit more open to the reality that Anakin was so much more than what he became. Um, and that we all have that opportunity. And to really kind of um, appreciate even for herself the choices that she's made um, to kind of get herself to that point. And I, I just, I love that, you know, when he, when you challenge, when he challenges her to be like, is that all that I am? As she really kind of can't help but continue to focus on the dark. Um, she's resisted. She's resisted for so long. Like it's just something that she's clearly so haunted by. And I think what's so powerful and what you get to see with Ariana and, you know, in the younger, you know, in the Clone War scene that we get to see and see you in that space is how young she was in those situations being this warrior. So you can understand how heavy this burden has been for so long. Um, but to be able to get to this point where she gets to choose to live um, and, and evolve then at that point because then she can have in, you know, in Natasha Sabine something to pass on that you know she can do fully and 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 i and think so, and so so beautifully because there is that complexity and those nuances it isn't just dark and light it's all the spectrum in between and really accepting that and and um and i think choosing to live that you know fully is is just one of the most beautiful lessons i think that is the thing i just so love about the storytelling and why I think it's been so compelling for generations. It's because that's the kind of stuff, that's the that's value you want to pass on to folks. Because even in your darkest days, that doesn't necessarily have to define you. Um, and that you can choose to to something else every single moment that you have. So that opportunity of seeing her potentially die and be in that space, you know, like she can succumb, you know, or she can she can rise to the challenge. And it's a different type of challenge. Um, that still has inherent risk, um, but I think one that she can do more fully and more, with more light than I think that we've been able to see in her for a long time. And that, that is what gets me excited about this part of her journey, is being able to see her embrace her full self, including all the people in her life and their complexities, because he wasn't easy. Ahsoka wasn't easy, and Sabine ain't easy. So it's, it's, it's quite a journey, but it's a, a, good, a good bumpy ride. So, so most people would know Sabine Wren from the, from the Rebels series. You're playing her se several years older and in live action. But in between those stories, there's been a break between her and Ahsoka. Tell us about getting inside Sabine's head at this stage. Did she have any corollaries for you to people in real life? I think, you know, we don't live in a galaxy far, far away, but I think Star Wars is always very relatable to characters who resonate. So where, yeah. how did you get inside of who Sabine was at this point in her life? Um, I, I find the relationship between any mentor and apprentice pretty fascinating um, in life. Even just as a young person as well, I feel like I seek out mentorship in life. Um, so that dynamic in itself is, um, really intriguing in all the different ways that can exist in the world. Um, and then for Sabine, I think, I love the fact that she does make so many mistakes and that she isn't the perfect model student and sometimes isn't deserving of patience or mentorship or um, trust, but she receives those things anyway from Ahsoka. And I think that says a lot um, because it isn't always the person who deserves it, or who is perfect, who is ready, but she's on the journey anyway. This is her path anyway, and it's really powerful because of all of those imperfections to me. Yeah. She's kind of not a natural. You, I think I yeah. applause. So if you want applause, <laughs> <laughs> just, just, 
often with Star Wars, it's like, oh, they've got natural abilities, and they just sort of take to it like a fish to water, but she's sort of like an engine that won't turn over, isn't she? Uh, <laughs> thanks, man. <laughs> no, thanks. But that's interesting. It's interesting to see somebody straining to connect with the Force. Is that right, Dave? I mean, that's something different to do with Star Wars. It's, well, it's just a challenge. I, I don't think it's ever easy. I think sometimes you have to remember that, like, it's a, a film, so things get condensed and lessons get condensed and so it might seem easier to the audience than it actually was meant to be or it is a reality but you know training in the ways of the force is a very difficult thing anyone anyone could do it um, you won't all have the same level of success sort of as surely as talent uh, decides kind of where your aptitude is in different areas of life but there are many things we know even in this life that would be better for us if we did it every day and we don't do it and so connecting to the force and finding uh, a greater power within ourselves, all of these things take a lot of training and patience and discipline. And most people don't have that. Sabine has a lot of success, especially as a rebel. But now she has to learn a different discipline to access this greater power. And that is difficult and also dangerous if it's acquired. So you're always kind of looking at those things uh, um, in these Star Wars, but in life as well when you're trying to be a good person and you quickly tumble out of that and they'll let your anger or your fear take you over. So that's what the training is supposed to get you by, but it doesn't always work out that way. And, and Hayden, you were fresh off of playing Vader, the Vader side of this character in the Obi-Wan Kenobi series. <coughs> and uh, you are, I remember you telling me you were excited to play that side because you were so steeped in Anakin's personality and his world before his turn. Uh, but you got to indulge the dark side, and then you play this version of uh, Anakin Skywalker in the world between worlds, who's, I think it's fair to say the audience isn't meant to know whether he's real or not, or whether that's in her head, or whether he's a force ghost. Tell us about what your thoughts were as you played this character. What was this entity in your mind? Yeah, I, I, um, <clears throat> I, I remember our first phone call, um, or a Zoom call, when we were first telling me about your sort of your vision for this and uh, and you asked me if I knew what the world between worlds was and I said yeah I do um, and I, I was just instantly really excited because it, it just creatively opened us up a lot um, in terms of what we could do with the character you know um, you know Anakin is is um, he's he goes through a lot in his life, and 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 in the prequels, he's 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 very emotional character. Um, but in this, this is a, this is a you know a post life version of the character, and 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 so he's he's aware of all of those things, but he's not emotionally beholden to those things either. So, um, so we we could you know we could present just a slightly different slant on the character, and and um, and I was. All game for that, and then and then getting to you know uh, explore sort of Clone Wars era Anakin was something that I was also really excited about um, because I remember even before you guys did the show, I remember George telling me about the Clone Wars when we were getting ready to do uh, Revenge of the Sith and just sort of filling me in on, on all the sort of backstory and how Anakin fought in the Clone Wars and, and he was this great warrior and a decorated general and. I remember just thinking, like, wow, that, that sounds really cool. I, you know, it'd be nice to see some of that. Maybe we can make a movie out of that. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then I loved what you, what you guys did in the animated world, and and and, uh, and so to get to sort of um, get our feet wet with that in, in live action was, was just a real privilege. Did you feel the character is still growing in this afterlife, or is his story written? I think that's for him. I, <laughs> is there, is there, is, does life go on in the uh, in the in the Force world, or does the? Uh, is the I know George not really really his life today, and so it's unfair of you to ask me these questions. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'll I'll I'll, I'll I'm going to do what I do. I'm going to bend away from your question. <laughs> I'm dodging, but I'm going to give you a different answer, which is a little more film centric and it's like so we, we can obsess about all of those things and i like you to do that when i'm not there and <laughs> you think about the world between world and what does it mean and for anakin and her and was he really there but really listen where does that come from um 
I, I needed to have a grounding in something that I feel cinematic. And so for me, the reason the episode's called Shadow Warrior is because it's an homage to Kagamusha. And in that film, the, the man pretending to be the Lord has a vision. There's a surrealistic sequence where, you know, he is confronted by this other character. And so for me, that was an opening cinematically. So that's an interesting story conceit. And I love the imagery that Kurosawa has created in that film. And I love the way that he was lighting that film. And so when I would talk to the DPs, we would talk a lot about other movies and things that we enjoyed. And that was one of the reference points. They get a list of films that they're supposed to watch before we <laughs> do everything. We you know, watch. So they can see these things. Some of them are better at getting through them than others. Um, I can tell. And that would be on the, the list of films. Because one of the things I learned about George working with him is he's a, he has seen everything. Like He's so encyclopedic with his knowledge of film. Uh, it comes up in editorial all the time. We talk uh, story through film and film experience. And so that was kind of imperative to have a touchstone. So and it's another thing. If I say this here, I, maybe kids will go watch it, and that would be great. Because mm -hmm. it is a wonderful film, and Curse always it's just a, obviously phenomenal, and you should watch it. This is something your dad did with you when you got into Star Wars. 100%. He knew I liked Star Wars. He knew somehow that George had worked with uh, Kurosawa, I think, because of Ron. And he said, well, if you like Star Wars, you'll, you'll like these movies. And he sat me down and had me watching those films. So, yeah, you pass on what you've learned, and there you go. Doug, you've been working in Star Wars since 1995. That's when Ooh. your work began. Yeah. That's when the, the episode one began production. And uh, uh, I wondered if you could share how your experience was on, on this series all these years later, a long time, it's more than a quarter century to begin working, or almost 30 years to be working in, in the world of Star Wars, but you obviously care deeply about it, and so much of that early prequel work was you presenting ideas to George, George presenting ideas to you, and a, a sort of feedback loop of creativity that resulted in world building. What was it like working with Dave on this series, and where did you start? What were some of your early ideas to expand, not just to other worlds in the galaxy, but to another galaxy, the neighboring galaxy itself? Yeah, no, I have to say, I mean, I was really excited about Ahsoka because of Dave. And, you know, Dave and I are one of the few remaining um, people at, at Lucasfilm who have worked directly with George, and we both went through sort of the George Lucas Film and Art School. And I've learned so much from him in terms of world building. And it's really interesting and fascinating for me because we're talking about mentors and apprentices, and I really see Dave as stepping up to be the next mentor for that. And so when Dave actually, you know, said, you know, let's let's see what we can do with the soccer, it was a terrific opportunity for me. I mean, one, I want to work with Dave forever because you know I've been a huge fan of what he was doing with designs for animation because I thought some of the most exciting designs uh, came from animation because. When I was working with George in 95, we were building the foundation for Star Wars design, sort of grounding sort of the, the rules, creating the rules for this playground. And then Dave took that on and kind of expanded on it. And I was always fascinated that, you know, here was a rich tapestry that built on Star Wars and pushed it even further. And I love that boldness of it. So when Dave said, you know, let's, let's see what we can do with, with um, Ahsoka, I really got excited because it was an opportunity to actually bridge the two, to actually combine and sort of make that cohesive universe that George always wanted. And on top of that, I think the characters that Dave and George came up with were just absolutely awesome. I think the biggest challenge for me was really, okay, how do we interpret that? How do we bring that world into live action to make it real? You know, because I have to say, you know, animation is, is really powerful because you do have a lot of creative license because it doesn't exist in a physical world. You know, so you can cheat in terms of the sets. But when we actually translate those designs to a real world where an actor has to walk through it, we have to really start figuring out the math to make sure that it all works. And Dave came up with a brilliant idea. He said, you know, let's think backwards, which is essentially, let's pretend the live action version came first and the animation was inspired by that. And that gave me a terrific framework to actually take the designs that Dave had created with his team and actually update it and refine it for live action while staying true to the designs. And for me, you know, that, that's what I find the most exciting about working in Star Wars because you know, since I came back to Lucasfilm in 2012, I think collectively with our series working with John Favreau and with Dave and along with our sequel films, 
we have about 17 feature films worth of content in the past five years. And we've, you know, I mean, for us, we know Star Wars really well, but there's always that part, like, how can we expand on this? How can we build this? What would George do? How can we actually add something new? And I found that with Dave, and that's what really excited me. Mm -hmm. yeah. You had to create something new. Tell me about creating the other, this neighboring galaxy uh, and the world that we visit there with, uh, um, with Thrawn. Yeah, no, you have to say, I mean, that was really one of the bold things because um, George would always surprise me when I worked with him, where he would actually throw these ideas out there and I had no idea how it would fit. And Dave did the same thing, you know, first with world between worlds, and then also, okay, you know, what is the faraway galaxy? What is that aesthetic? Because we wanted to create something that still fit within Star Wars, but yet actually fill the sort of the, the, um, the connect the dots in terms of the storytelling. And for me, it was like, okay, well, what should this new galaxy be? What is the aesthetic? What is the technology? And they said, you know, well, it's sort of uh, an exotic technology. It's different, but it still has to adhere by our rules. And we first saw that with Thrawn's uh, Star Destroyer, because we knew that, you know, from the animation series, the finale. The, the Star Destroyer was you know, taken over into the faraway galaxy by the Purgles. And so we wanted to reflect that. And one of the brilliant ideas that they've had was, okay, well, how do we sort of connect that for the fans so that when we see Thrawn's Star Destroyer, we know that he was thrown there and it's been repaired. But he, it's been repaired by witch magic. And the idea that there was this gold, you know, sort of filament um, technology that is very exotic, something that we've never seen before. But and what we did was we actually grounded it in the real world. Uh, with Kintsuki, you know, that we're, you know, the, the broken uh, pottery in Japan where you take a broken object and you actually put it back together to make an art form out of it. We thought, wouldn't that be fantastic if we took a Star Destroyer and did that? And so you see that, you see it through the, the exterior where it actually all the damage actually ties into the animated version where the Purgles attacked it. And then we also saw that in the Night Troopers, you know, how their armor had this sort of gold filament. And so that was a really fun thing because it grounded in something that we we're very familiar with, but we were actually putting into a new context within our Star Wars world. And we can find those connective tissues because Star Wars at the end is grounded in reality. We have to relate to it. It can't be so fantastic because George always thought that this was a documentary film. And so we can't be too fantasy. He never thought of it as a fantasy film. It was, it's grounded in reality. And so we always try to find those elements so that even when we're designing for a far away galaxy, we have to make it real in that sense. And I think that was one of those wonderful opportunities where it all kind of worked. And I, you know, the other one was the, um, the Scion Bridge. And that was the first hint, because that was such a bold statement that scared the crap out of me. <laughs> because they said, let's create a bridge that's made out of gold and make it really exotic. And my first thought was like, wow, we're going to break Star Wars. But we didn't, you know, because what we did was we actually grounded it in sort of our reality. We looked at a switch wash in terms of all of the intricate mechanisms and said, okay, what happens if we took that, blew it up, and turned it into a bridge? And then sort of figured out the logic to it. And what was wonderful was when we did that, it actually connected to the history of what George was doing when he was doing it, because we referenced Metropolis. All those exotic, weird technology from the 1930s that was sort of the foundation of George's world building, we actually tied it all together. And for us, it made beautiful sense. And I was so happy that you know, Dave was very bold and took the risk, because I think when we take those risks, that's when we achieve something pretty sweet. Kevin, you also go way back with Star Wars. Tell us when you first wrote the theme for Ahsoka. I, uh, I first wrote Ahsoka's theme in either 2006 or 2007. It was the first thing that I did for George Lucas and Dave after they'd hired me. So a couple weeks in for my new bosses. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, having that new boss in particular, no offense, Dave, but, <laughs> you know, that was a big deal. Um, I, it's funny, I, I was terrified when I met, when I, I knew I was gonna met, meet George, and then, once I met him and started hanging with Dave and him, all that went away. And all the intimidation went away. He's such a nice man. Dave's such a, a nice cat. And Dave and I get along really, really well. It's crazy. Um, <laughs> but uh, so I, yeah, so that was the first thing I wrote. And it just came, it, you know, I always see, when I see something, I, I hear music. And this little girl was sitting on her bunk 
alone in a tiny little cell in a, in a spaceship, and I just heard those notes. And I wrote it for a, a shakuhachi, which is a Japanese flute. Funny enough, Dave would bring back the Japanese influence in, in a very big way, and it helped mature that theme. In fact, I just met Rosario Dawson, a big thing on my to-do list of <laughs> life, uh, a few minutes ago. And, and, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I sit in a cave and I write music all day long. I don't know if you guys know how glamorous my gig is. That's, that's what seriously I do. And, and, and I told her, and these words just came to me, it's like, you, you took my little girls and, and, and you grew her up. And, and I had to do that musically. Um, and that's what happened, I think, when, when we started writing, you know, band credits really is what we started writing. I, I co-write with my two children, Sean and Dina. And uh, yeah, I think so. You anticipate my next question, which is, we are talking about mentorship and uh, parents and children and you, uh, you live that in your work. You brought your two children into the work you do. Tell me about that collaboration and when do children start to listen to their father? Because <laughs> <laughs> my um, son is backstage. I, I'm pretty, pretty sure it's going to happen soon. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Uh, you know, somebody had asked me, you know, one of, well, one of my great memories of writing uh, with my children is and I'd never been asked that question, and I thought about it, and I, I flashed to a moment. So I wrote a Soka's theme in 2006, and now we're working on the live action of Soka, and Sean and Dina are sitting at my piano uh, that Sean grew up as a very young boy, playing every single morning, waking me up, playing his exercises and stuff, and now they're sitting together there, and they're working on that groove, that dun, 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 uh, and, and at first it wasn't that, you know, and they're, they're trying to think, because they're super into anime and they're super into the whole samurai vibe and everything, um, as, as is Dave. And I wouldn't have been able to do that. I wouldn't have come up with da, 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 da. I, I, that wouldn't have happened. That only happened with the two of them sitting down there at the piano and taking a theme that I wrote and then moving it forward. It was a pretty special moment for me. Hmm. I want to talk about some of, the, some of the people who are the very important creative elements of this show who are on stage uh, with us today. And one of them is costume designer Shauna Tripsek. She, she has to be a um, You can see some of her work in person in the gallery outside, so make sure you stop by and see the, the costumes that are on display there. But I wondered if, Dave, you could talk about working with her and collaborating on the looks of, uh, of your characters, and, and maybe the, the actors could talk about your particular costume and, and elements of it that you found especially inspiring. Yeah, I mean, I, I love what I do. Um, I love working on Star Wars. When you find people that uh, just get it and they click with you, it's, it's so special. I think our whole team is that way, but Shauna in particular, um, you know, she, I, there's no way to say it, she loved it. And she watched all of the animation, which, you know, that's not incredibly normal for me, but like she knew it. And so she knew going in these characters, she knew what made them special. And I just, it's one of the things I look forward to the most is seeing what her and the team would come up with. Uh, she took, everything I would say and just made it better. You know, directing, people think it's about getting what you want or you know, telling people what to do. It's not that at all. You try to just inform people and then let them do their magic and then they bring it back better than you could have imagined. And Shauna just always made it better. I was always so thrilled with what she did and the team and it just, you know, apart from the amazing costumes which they can talk about in more detail, you have to understand like she, she looked out for people on set. We have a very tight group. You know, if you weren't feeling well, she's coming at you with turmeric and cayenne. Like and she's <laughs> in a bottle, shaking it up and like, Dave, take this. You know, it's like, 
you just would go in her office and it's comfortable. It feels right. That's because she is just a wonderful person. And it's a, you know, it's a, it's a massive loss, uh, creatively, personally, for all of us. And you just, I'm so glad she was a part of this and I see her in everything Ahsoka. You know, when I see a toy, I see her costumes and that makes me feel good that I see that out there that she lives on in, in so many ways. And I know that she was happy uh, with what she did and I miss her. Uh, it's a lot and it should be because that means that people are meaningful, uh, special to you. Uh, they gave everything and I, I appreciate that and I'll, I'll, I'm glad she's a part of this and always will be. I'd love to hear from you three. Rosario, tell me about working with her in your costume. Was there a particular part of Ahsoka's outfit that, that moves you or you find inspiring? I mean, Shauna was one of the first people that I met. Um, she was one of the first people that I started developing what this version, this timeline of Ahsoka would be. And I, I remember I thought I was gonna lose the job because I was so excited putting on this costume that she had made, because <laughs> it was new, like that this story Ahsoka was gonna live on. And I was like, I think literally doing jumping jacks. And I was like, they're gonna rethink this casting because this exuberance does not fit right now in this moment of her journey. Um, and she just was so, she was just as animated. Like she had all of that history that was there and she delighted in being able to, you know, embed certain little bits and ideas. And, you know, I remember talking about my Padawan beads and, you know, she'd show me the patch that she put on Jason's costume. And, you know, when we were developing into her, into Ahsoka the White, like, there was just every little bit of it. She was so excited to the point where she waited online for hours so that she could get the first cape at Disneyland. She had designed, and she would show me, like, when she first made my first cape, she was like, but look at it. Like, look at the stitching. It's all hand done. Do you see the colors? Like, she, every, I, when I tell you the fabric, that every stitch meant so much to her. And when you say, like, that constantly improving and developing, it was, to the last day of filming, she'd be tweaking it, adjusting, pulling, is that too tight here? Like, can you move for this battle in a way that, that feels free? Let's just adjust it again. There was just constant adjustments, constant perfectionism. You could, she, was, she would say repeatedly, don't, don't hesitate to say something, you know? And that collaboration, like, you know, helped it create certain styles, you know, and, and kind of develop the costume in a certain way to go, okay, this is how we take it from a drawing and an idea into something real. Um, and so it felt like a second skin. This is, this is, you know, Ahsoka's armor. You know, this is, you know, this might be the last thing she ever wears because she is that Ronin who goes into every battle knowing she might not come out of it and goes fully. And it was just so beautiful to collaborate with someone who just literally showed up every day so fully as well. It was, it was beautiful. She was wonderful. Aiden, how did you guys discuss the, uh, what was the thing that went into the look of this character who is not necessarily real, but how do you decide how he appears? Um, yeah, well, 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 you know, the, the Anakin costume is, is, is consistent from what we've known before, but, but getting to create the Clone Wars costume um, I, I was, I was, you know, delighted by, and I thought she did such a wonderful job. Um, and I, I was just really thankful to get to, to meet her and work with her. You know, I, I think the costume design in Star Wars is, is such an incredible creative expression, so specific and so detailed. Um, and, and I was so impressed by, by her as a creative person. And, uh, she just had such a, a life force to her. Uh, it was always a pleasure to be around. Natasha. Sabine's cush. Yeah, I mean, I think these guys said it all about how special Shauna was um, and the energy she brought um, every day. My very first fitting, I actually put on bo armor. Um, and I was like, oh, damn, like you really look this good in real life too. It's not all just post, you know? Um, and I think one of the things I was dreading was kind of like, as an actor, especially knowing I had stunts coming 
was like, how hard is it gonna be to do stunts in this thing? And that just wasn't a concern because she, you know, as they said, took that into account as like such an important thing for each character to embody um, the physicality and, and the authenticity that that brought um, to, the, to the fight scenes, the duels, to the way they stood even. Um, so yeah, the, the armor is functional. It protected me. I needed protection. Um, and Shauna was just, yeah, the best. I also want to just say there's a lot that we, you know, you don't see in it. One of the things that we talked about all the time is like you're not going to see zippers. You're not going to see all of these different stuff. So it was just like a lot of seamlessness that I thought was really beautiful. You know, there was just always, like, I, I, you know, I was baffled as to how it was like, how is Hu Yang helping her put this on? Because, you know, and we would joke about it like all the time because there's like this incredible, especially with the Mandalorian costumes and stuff, like there's a lot of, you know, like just maneuvering, you know, to kind of be in this, in this thing, but it felt like, it, it, I guess it was that armor, that seamless sort of armor and it, and it brought it, into, it didn't feel like a costume, you know, it felt like part of each of these different characters, it was ex an extension of themselves. And um, yeah, I, I really, I appreciated that care and that love. And you know, there's a lot of um, shh, but it was on. <laughs> Unfortunately, we're out of time now. We could go on and on, there's so much to talk about, but I wanna give a name check to some of the, was somebody really? <laughs> I know, it's all so cool. <laughs> Check some of the people who worked on the show, some of your department heads who are here, they're watching in the green room. Um, you've got your editing team, Dana E. Globerman, Roseanne Tan, James D. Wilcox, <laughs> the cinematographers, Koyan Tran, Eric Spielberg, their makeup artist, Christina Waltz. In view of all the people on this stage, you are in Star Wars, you get into Star Wars for life. Decades go by, it becomes something, ask Mark Hamill and Harrison Ford, you play for a long, long time. Um, but you're, you have worked with a lot of the same people. Tell me about this fellowship of people who worked on Ahsoka and what they mean to you. Oh gosh, well, I mean look, I, I love the first day, I love the last day, it was sad when we were finished. I love making the show, I love working with these people, our entire team. You know, they, they, I think they love the show. I think they love my dog more than me. <laughs> uh, he's there with us on set every day. Um, you know, George once told me, if you can't have fun making stars, what can I have fun doing? It's a part of it. It should be fun. It should be an adventure. Uh, you go through it all. I think production companies, film groups, we're always like a, a close-knit group. But we all loved it every day, I think, you know. Um, and, and just marveling at everything that each department would bring. Props, you know, the, the lighting, the costumes, the makeup, everything, everyone was like, when I got to Mandalorian on season one, crew were asking me when we were gonna do Ahsoka. There were people on that crew, season one Amanda, that wanted to see this character come to life. So after years, I mean, the, the only one who wasn't ready was me. I didn't, I'd never done live action before. So I had to learn. And when we finally stepped up to do it, that team was so ready. Every single person on that team. I always say, there's no one job that's more important than the others. We're all team working, collaborating. And I will say, and everybody feels it, you know, from Shauna, but I also have to mention Ray Stevenson. Ray, uh, this costume is one of the ones. Costumes out here, yeah. Ray, it, it was a joy to work with. He. The only thing he loved more than the show and being Balin was his family, you know, and uh, th and that just says his character's right there from the beginning. He he wanted to be a part of this so badly. He brought so much to it. If you look at that costume, all the rocks on it, the green stones are things Ray would find on the weekend <laughs> and come in and say, Dave, can we put this on the costume? I'm like, Ray, knock yourself out. If that helps you. <laughs> Next thing I know, Balin's got these big rings on and green stones everywhere, but I'm like, that must be it. Like, he, he was that guy, but he was such, for as menacing as he could be on screen, he was as gentle as possible off. 
I mean, there was, there was nothing better than finding all the bad guys gathered on a stage somewhere, <laughs> listening to their bad guy music, <laughs> thinking that they're all bad guys, and they're all the nicest people. It's weird. <laughs> and Ray was kind of the kingpin of that whole little group. And again, like, it's just, it's, a, it's incredibly sad, but I'm so glad that, that he was a part of it. Um, and, uh, and again, his, he wanted to wield that lightsaber. I, I just wish he got to see all of it. I think he'd have been really proud, and I'm so proud of him and his family, and that he got to be there. Uh, so yeah, it's uh, bittersweet, but uh, very special. I know it's a lot of work, but the one thing I hear from all of you, and those of you who've been working on it for, for decades now, is that it, it, despite the hard work, there is an element of play. We're still playing Star Wars. So thank you for being here with us today. Let's hear it for a second.